Hello, today is March 16th, 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. Daryl Harther at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Daryl, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Well, thank you very much, and I really commend you for this project that you're doing. Well, the, the honor is all mine in regards to you. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you are born, a little bit about your family. All right. Um, I was born uh, January 19th, uh, January 17th, 1926, in uh, Boone, Iowa, and uh, I lived on a farm, uh, but the nearest town was Story City, Iowa, uh, so that's after uh, going to elementary school at a parochial school in that area where I lived, I went to high school at Story City and uh, have a lot of fond memories of that since my class has been quite active with annual reunions, yeah. so I've been back there quite a few times. Now, any brothers or sisters? One sister, about three years older, Okay. and uh, how boys and girls are, I was the guy who was always on a pony riding or doing some Thing of that nature and so I really didn't do much with her yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh, before we kind of go into your your military history one event uh, prior to that uh, a major I think historical event I'm wondering if you have many memories or if it affected you at all was the Great Depression I can remember the drought years they were kind of the mid 30s 34 35 mm -hmm. I think it was something and um, it was terribly dry, uh, cropping, just there were no crops that really grew. Uh, as far as dust, as described in the Dust Bowl days, we we didn't experience Yeah, you're that. further east than that. Although yeah, I understand yeah. some of that dust end, uh, ended up in New York. Yeah, right, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And uh, as far as the Great Depression, was your family affected by that at all? I mean, you may have been too young to, to realize it, but... Well, uh, didn't have any money, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, no, my, my mother had a large garden, and uh, we always had meat, so I think everything was, uh, and we burned wood for heat, so uh, we had trees there, so. Very self-efficient, sufficient then. Yeah, yeah, a lot okay. of uh, outlay of money for that. Mm -hmm. Now, what year then did you, you went to the school system, what year did you graduate from high school? 1943. 43, so. I uh, was probably the youngest in our class, because I was just, over 17 by those few months, and uh, our class was quite close. We all knew each other well. Oh, wonderful. So 43, so that's uh, roughly two years uh, after the war started. Do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I, uh, I have to be in Boone. Uh, that was the town where we usually went on Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember hearing it, and uh, whoever I was with, uh, I just had a feeling of, of dread disaster, something is going to happen, but uh, they passed over and then yeah, yeah. continued on from there. Yeah. So you graduated in 43, you were still 17, so still too young for the draft. What did you do then after high school? I helped my father. Oh, on the farm? He uh, had quite a bit of land and livestock. And of course I turned 18 in January, and um, I believe I received a draft notice probably by uh, March. So, but as, a, as an only son on the farm, you couldn't get an exemption for uh, or a deferment for, uh, for that? Uh... We never even asked for it because the patriotism of the young fellows at that time was such that uh, I didn't want to. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, you get your uh, your draft notice. Then how soon after that did you did you ship off to boot it camp? It was soon, probably um, two two weeks. Oh really? Oh wow! Two to three weeks something. And do you remember that day when you left? Did your folks see you off at the train station yes. or the bus station? Well, or? we uh, yes, we were sworn in on the uh, steps of the uh, county building, and um, I don't know. There must have been twenty five of us. They loaded us on buses. We went to Des Moines, and uh, whether we transferred there, anyway, we ended up at Leavenworth, Kansas, Fort Leavenworth, and that's where um, I had my physical, um, or uh, processed everything, and uh, received a uniform. 
and I can remember yet walking on base, uh, I think the first evening, we met some officers and uh, they stopped us and, aren't you going to salute an officer? I said, I didn't know that. <laughs> we hadn't really been uh, introduced to that yeah, yet, yeah. that's fine. Well, along those lines, and maybe a, a, a question I should ask later on, but how, how was that adjustment going from civilian life to military life for you? Was that much of a, a shock or an adjustment for you? It, it was uh, an adventure that uh, being young, it uh, came pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, along those lines, too, uh, many of your generation at that time really didn't travel too far away from home or the farm, and here you, you're, you're taking off. I, I would assume for for the first time for a long period of time. Was there any sort of a tinge of homesickness or anything in, in that, uh, at that point or further on down your story? Yes, it's true that I hadn't traveled that much. Uh, our relatives were uh, between uh, Eastern Iowa and Chicago, had been that far. But as far as homesickness, um, I can't remember. Sure, I missed things, but uh, at the same time, we were kept very busy. So you didn't really have a lot of time to dwell on things mm -hmm. and think of that mm -hmm. nature. Okay. All right. Well, uh, continue your story then. You're in boot camp. If you want to continue the, to continue your story from there. Yes. We uh, traveled from uh, Fort Leavenworth to uh, Weatherford, Texas, which is east of Fort Worth, about 40 miles. It's hill country there. Traveled by train, and um, uh, that's where we started our basic training. Oh, okay. And uh, the basic training was was very intense. I felt very good as far as training. We trained with small arms, we trained with mortars, and um, had night maneuvers, uh, learned uh, um, moving by the use of a compass and all, and uh, I thought it was uh, quite complete. Uh, we had a very good sergeant who was a European veteran. We had a captain who was uh, had combat experience also. So it was a real thing. We we weren't just uh, reading out of a book. I guess uh, I don't know if I should ask this question now or wait till we get further into your story. But now that you look back on it, or when you were in actual combat, as you look back on your training, how well do you think that prepared you for actual combat? Well, we certainly knew how to handle the firearm. That was one main thing. As far as how to stre how to deal with the uh, Stress of combat, I don't know if you can train for that or not. That's something you have to experience and see how you cope with it. So in any of the war games or anything they play, or they, was it anywhere, anywhere remotely close to actual combat, do you think? Uh, well, we had uh, that type of maneuver at night, but uh, no, it no, was, yeah. still wasn't yeah. anywhere near yeah. the same. And then how long were you down in Texas and roughly in, in combat or in uh, basic? Uh, probably four, four and a half months, something like that. And then I was uh, giving uh, leave and uh, came back home and uh, saw my family and uh, my wife, Betty. We were by that time soulmates and uh, uh, I spent a few days there. Now, when you talk, uh, wife Betty, had you guys married? Or were you still dating at that point, oh, or had you married? We, we were dating. Yes, okay, yes. okay, but eventually became your wife. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, then I traveled to uh, Fort Ord, California. Uh, didn't know what we were going to do, except we did do some more small arm uh, training there. But I wasn't there too awfully long. But uh, given the direction you were traveling, it kind of gave you an idea which theater of operation yes. you were heading yes. to. Uh, you could tell that we were heading for the Pacific. And then we went from Fort Ord to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. And uh, that was mainly preparation for going overseas. And uh, then shortly after that, I wasn't there too long, uh, left there to uh, uh, on a Liberty ship on, on our way to we ended up Hawaii. Now, at this point, had you been put into a unit or a, a, a squad or anything at that point, or were you still traveling more or less independently? No, independently, okay. except I knew a number of fellows from our training, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, we didn't all end up. I think, if I remember right, there were only two other fellows in my eventual company beside that I knew. Okay. Well, you, you're taking this uh, Liberty ship to Honolulu, which uh, begs the question, here's a, an Iowa farm boy, 
how was that how was that trip did you get your sea legs uh, how was that talk about that trip across well it was pretty easy on the rations from the army standpoint or, or navy i only ate about half the meals <laughs> it uh, it was a rough sea a rough travel plus the fact we were zigzagging mm -hmm. and uh, the role of the ship from side to side port to strip whatever it is port, uh, anyway uh, that wasn't too bad but when it went from bow to stern that's when you felt the vibration of the propeller as it came near the surface and uh, wondered how well there, the welding was on the uh, oh, ship. Oh boy. Uh, but it held together yeah. and we arrived safely. Well now you said you guys zigzagged across there. Obviously that was to, uh, uh, in case of Japanese subs. Did that ever play into your mind that boy, uh, we could be torpedoed at any time? Oh, sure, uh, yeah. But uh, we felt fairly secure. How long, roughly, do you remember how long it took you to get to Hawaii? I'm guessing about 10 days. And what would you do with all that downtime? What would, what was going on the ship there? What would you do to keep yourself busy or entertained? Um, card game. Cards game. Yeah, yeah. Things, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So you guys arrive in Honolulu. Um, is that where you picked, or I guess take your story from there. Yes, uh, arrived in Honolulu. And uh, we took the pineapple train up the middle of the island. Oh, wow. And that was Schofield, uh, Army uh, unit. And um, we did a little training there, but not very much. And then we again got on the ship and headed west, naturally, and uh, ended up at Saipan, part of the Marianas. And uh, at S Saipan, Again, we weren't there a long time, but long enough to uh, uh, get to know the country a little bit. We didn't stray very far. Uh, the The main excitement was uh, some nights the uh, Japanese that were still in hiding there would come in and try to raid the mess hall for food and, of course, everything up in arms. And we went out on a few small patrols, but that was about it. How, how was that, once again, I, I know I keep going back to the, the Iowa farm boy, but here's here you are now halfway around the world in these exotic locations. That must have been some an exciting period of time for, for you there and to yes, experience that was. time. But as I said before, 18, 19 year old, you adapt pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Any problems with the the climate and the weather being in the tropics like that, uh, dealing know. with that at all? No, it was, it was comfortable. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then... Uh, from Saipan? Okay, Saipan, we loaded again and uh, went southwest and ended up at Ulithi. It's a island, oh, not too far from the equator. And uh, we waited there to join up with the convoy. And uh, then we headed north. And uh, I should mention, while we were at Sa Saipan, uh, at the PX, there was a large map of the Pacific. and. Uh, uh, in detail enough, you could tell the islands by name and all. And uh, the island of Okinawa was smudged with fingerprints. People, wow, <laughs> we didn't know for sure, but yeah. that was the logical because it was only 300 miles from Japan. And uh, there was some talk about Formosa, but Formosa would have been uh, quite a lot further away. And uh, Anyway, so they weren't telling you where you're going, but by the smudge marks, obviously people pointing to the island that, that just kind of gave you that poll, gut feeling that's where you're heading, huh? Yeah, if you took a poll, that was, <laughs> that was that. Well, now at this point, had uh, uh, they been keeping you up to date on how the war was progressing? Did you have any idea how we were doing? And uh, were they feeding that kind of information down to you guys? No, uh, that wasn't until we were actually getting close to Okinawa. The invasion was on Easter Sunday, April 1, 1945. And I was not part of that initial invasion. We arrived probably about mid-April, about 15, and um, the landing, according to the history of the uh, uh, book that is uh, relating to my division, was largely unopposed. It was some casualties, and there were four divisions. Uh, my division that I eventually joined, the 96th Infantry Division, was on the right. Next to us was the 7th Division on our left, and then the uh, 1st Marine Division and the 6th. And uh, they moved across the island pretty quickly, and the two Marine Divisions, we didn't know where the enemy was located, 
the two Marine, Marine divisions uh, moved north, and uh, the 96th and the 7th headed south. And again, there were a few days that they had pretty easy going, but then uh, I missed the mi first major battle they ran when they ran into the an uh, enemy in the area of Kapazu. Now, when you landed, was there a, a, like a, a secure harbor that you landed on, or did you guys come in on Higgins' boat and land on the beach, or how was your? How did you arrive on the island? We uh, arrived on Higgins' boats. Okay. Yes, yes. They all uh, all the shipping was scattered because the kamikazes were already starting to come mm. in and head for the navy, and uh, uh, we must have hit a lull because we didn't have any threat to us at that time. But uh, we were out quite a distance. And then how would you get into the beach? You took the, the, the landing craft into the beach landing then? Landing craft. Okay. The beach, yes. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, I guess continue your story once you've landed. Now you're on the island and take okay, her from there. Then we went again to be processed and um, spent maybe one night being assigned to a unit. And then we probably moved in company strength or something like that going up. We, we knew where, where we were going, but we were various units and all. And I remember we hadn't traveled far uh, along a little, um, they had a road number, fifth, uh, number five that went uh, uh, up or down the island about in the center. We may have been on that, although a road, it was really not a road, it was just more of a trail. Are, are you guys moving by foot at this? Or by foot, okay. yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I never rode anything in any vehicle. <laughs> um, and our first baptism of fire was a mortar that they called the boxcar. It was a huge, huge mortar that you could actually see it in the air. Wow. Coming. And when it landed, um, there was a probably 20, 15, 20 feet across and Ten feet deep. The shell hole. Oh, the shell hole. From is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you saw this thing, could could you estimate where that thing was going to land? And give you did you give you enough time to to get out of the way and well, make shelter? Or how? Fortunately, he was off his mark a little bit. It was the distance was right, but uh, it was probably a uh, oh, hundred yards off mark to the side. Wow. wow. Now, it's. It certainly got your attention. Wow. And you know, there again comes back, I have to think of this, um, I have the reflex even yet now of hitting the dirt the minute I hear anything. Is that we, right? We stood and watched it because we didn't have that built-in type of feeling. We right. We thought, oh, this is interesting. Wow. <laughs> Could you describe to, to, the, these, to those that watch us what you're seeing, the topography, and, and, and what, it, what it looked like, what you were seeing as you were marching towards the, well, to the front. Well, the, the, uh, the north end of the island, I'll speak of that first, mm -hmm. I was never up there until we went back some years later. And uh, that was uh, uh, mountainous, wooded, and uh, kind of a range of mountains going up through the center of it. Going south, and that's, I'm sure, why the Japanese decided to defend that portion, there were small little... Um, I wouldn't call them mountains, hills, and then a lot of escarpments that were at right angles to us. They, we had to uh, cross one and then there'd be another one in the way of that. So it, it was uh, uh, visibility when you're on top, you could see a long way, but when you were at the uh, valley level, I, you had mostly hills around you. And, and vegetation was what, roughly? Ve vegetation was pretty well chopped out. Wow, wow. Yeah, the artillery had done a good job on that. Okay. We started running into uh, many of the tombs, uh, and those were family tombs, and they were always built into a hillside. Uh, the, uh, the, the roof was covered with earth, and uh, they were concrete. The opening was just large enough that you could get on your hands and knees and crawl into it. And oftentimes there was um, uh, some kind of a stone or a granite or something like that in 
in the front of the imprints. Now, would would the Japanese use these for like pillboxes at all, or were they did they pretty much leave them alone? Or no, they didn't because they had had time to fortify that island very okay. well, and if they had uh, uh, pillboxes or caves, they usually had a back exit that they could get out, and. Um, uh, we, I, I've been back twice. In 1995, they had the 50th anniversary, and uh, my wife and I went back along with many of our, my division. And uh, consequently, there were so many people, it was difficult to really do the things you wanted mm -hmm, to do. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 2001, we, we have three daughters, and uh, we took them along with their husbands, so there were eight of us, went back over. And that was uh, the opportunity we had to really see things and go anywhere we wanted. And uh, that was a great experience. Wow, wow. So um, I guess continue your story, getting into the front lines and where you finally got dug in. And I guess just once again, continue your story. from. Well, you know. yes, we were then assigned to a company as well as you know, the regiment and, and all and uh, got to know. And uh, we were online, moved. We were in reserve that time, moved into line, and uh, we were probably in the line about uh, 10 days when my uh, platoon commander, Lieutenant Dent, came to me and he said, would you volunteer to uh, go back and get some medical training? Well, you know, we generally in the Army, you didn't volunteer for anything, but uh, I felt since he asked me, and I don't know why he selected me, uh, I determined that what he was trying to do was fill the gap. We had um, we had only one medic for the company, and uh, there were no replacements available. So I did go back to the field hospital, spent uh, I think two days there, and um, turned in my M1 rifle, and they gave me a carbine, and um, I carried a 45 sidearm and a medical bag and uh, learned the basics that uh, what you're trying to do with a wounded stop the bleeding uh, whether it was compression or what tourniquet or whatever it took um, apply sulfa uh, the compression bandage or whatever it, we needed and uh, try and keep them from going into shock and uh, probably give a shot of morphine and then on a stretcher letter we called them uh, Evacuate him back to the uh, to the field hospital. So, so with two days training, you, you become the company medic, huh? <laughs> I yes. Uh, uh, the main thing is take care of them somehow, and and give get them stabilized people, enough to get them back to the, yes, yeah. and and give the comp the people in the company the confidence that if they're hit, somebody's going to come and get them. Mm -hmm. And that was my job. I. They called medic. I was off and gone. Now, as we had talked uh, prior to this interview, uh, the Japanese didn't adhere to the Geneva Convention that you don't shoot me shoot at medics. Uh, you didn't. Uh, so you weren't you weren't exempt from being shot. And and we don't. You also mentioned that you didn't wear the uh, the, the the medic uh, insignia on yeah. your helmet or anything. That's true. Nothing or or the armband either one. And um, I I. I've never been told, but I think the fact that uh, officers and medics looked a little different because the bag I was carrying could have been a map case, oh, okay. could have been something of that nature. I was also not carrying an M1 rifle, it was a carbine, fired all the same shell, but it, um, it, it just looked different. Well, so boy. consequently I uh, stood guard the same as I had as a rifleman. Uh, it was a two-man foxhole, and uh, it was like uh, two hours on, two hours off, and uh, uh, if I needed to defend, which I did, uh, that was just part of the game. I was not a conscientious objector. Yeah, that was yeah. the only main difference. We didn't have any in our regiment that I know, but I, I do know one man in the uh, 7th Division who was a conscientious objector, and he actually got the Medal of Honor. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. he was on um, on one of the ridges, Tombstone Ridge, and uh, uh, many shot up, and he lowered them 
against the peril of his own life, and uh, uh, I think he's lowered 15 of them or so, something like that. Mm. So, so right. you're now you've now become a greater target than you were prior to that, I guess. Uh, did that play on your mind at all, or did you realize that at all, or was uh, it even every, a thought? Everyone was a target. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, talk to us a little bit about, uh, particularly like myself or others that will watch us that have haven't the slightest idea what it's like to be in the thick of battle. Uh, what was it like in the foxhole, the conditions? Obviously, you said you were two hours on, two hours off, so it doesn't sound like you were getting enough sleep. You were probably tired all the time. Uh, how to, you know, you're, you're tired. Uh, it sounds like, uh, you know, you're on the elements all the time. You probably had showered hygiene, probably wasn't so good. Any of those alone, I think, would, would eventually wear down a person, but now you've got the, the umbrella of the stress of war on top of that. How do you how do you how do you function in, in a, a situation like that? Most times, the nights were somewhat tougher than the days because uh, you didn't know what was out there, and the Japanese were intent on the infiltration, either single or in larger groups, and uh, <clears throat> we had the benefit of flares. We shot up flares often in order to light the area, and uh, anything you tried to be a as observant as you could be, and uh, if a particular spot didn't look right, you'd zero on looking at it, and the next time the flare came on, uh, if it had moved, you knew then it was uh, enemy coming in. Uh, there were a couple of unusual incidences. Well, I should also say uh, they would sometimes walk in, and they'd get an American helmet to give a little different silhouette from their helmet and uh, some of them could speak English well enough to say, don't shoot, it's me, Joe. And uh, you really didn't take much of a chance of anyone above ground at night, unless we were doing something that was a planned. Uh, if someone was uh, hit, why well, holler out medic and away I'd go. But mm. uh, uh, other than that, uh, one night we had what looked like about uh, old platoon strength uh, coming up this, uh, we were set up in an L-shaped formation. There were two ridges that uh, in the center there was a little trail. And uh, we thought maybe it was a outfit to our side that was pulling back. And when they got close enough, we saw they were Japanese. Oh boy. And of course that was a night fight. Uh, other times, uh, there were other night incidences, but uh, another unusual thing that I started to say, there was a, um, a group coming towards us uh, in civilian clothing, waving a white flag. When actually, we had never had the chance to have any, take a, uh, a prisoner. No one would surrender. And uh, when they got close enough, the front ones leaned over and they had a machine gun strapped on their back. Oh, boy. And that's what happened. Well, when you have those things happen, you get very wary and conscious of anything. You can never let your, it seemed like you could never let your guard down. No, yeah. no. Oh. Yeah, you, you try to always observe what is out of the normal of what you're looking at. Now, in your foxhole, it would be the two of you, so would one be on lookout and the other would try to get some sleep and, and rotate that way? Is yes. that how you? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, in early May, and it lasted most of May, we had a lot of rain. It rained, it seemed like, every day and night at the well. And uh, it got so that we weren't really sure that our rifles would always fire. So we used my 45 to sand guard a lot of nights, and uh, we could kind of keep it hidden out of the dirt and mud and all, but um, uh, it, it was, uh, that, that's how the night went. So you laid in this hole that was full of water and mud? and Yeah, we bail it out with our helmets oh, and uh, maybe get uh, some sleep, but you, it wasn't unusual to wake up in one or two inches of water. There's no way you could put a cover over the top of that? Oh no, no, if you put a slicker over top and the flare went up, yeah, it is, uh, like a reflect. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. One question that uh, made me think uh, here, a statement you made earlier, you're saying that at night everybody kind of stayed below ground, uh, but if somebody yelled medic, you were up and going at it, then that put you at risk at uh, potentially uh, 
friendly fire from somebody. Well, I, I would call out. Oh, okay. I would call out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, that we got along with that, all right. Okay. We made some real early morning assaults, but not generally in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like uh, an hour or so before daylight, trying to get the advantage of uh, some ground taken, which was not always successful. We didn't have an adequate cover. Now, when you talk ground taking and moving, are, are, are you talking hundreds of yards at a time, miles or feet, or how were you gauge gauge your movement? I guess for it us, was yards, yards. <laughs> yes. Oh, jeez. Yes, uh. because the the ridges were fairly close together, and if it wasn't that, uh, it was um, the hills that also gave cover and all. Um, I have a history book showing the um, crossfire that had been set up by the Japanese in the Shuri area, which was the main defensive position, and uh, they could hit us from all angles. Mm. Wow. wow. We were never really sure that uh, the enemy wouldn't be behind us because there were some pockets that uh, uh, they, they might be able to emerge from. When we were back, uh, we walked through uh, tunnels that uh, we had no idea. So they had, the, uh, much like, like Okinawa and such, they had a tunnel system throughout Okinawa as yeah. well? The Japanese had uh, time to uh, uh, do the fortification and use the Okinawa civilians to uh, dig in the coral. They didn't have to shore up. It was uh, uh, stable enough to hold uh, a good tunnel. and. Uh, the main objectives uh, on the uh, on the one coast was the major city of Naha, and um, on the other coast, which would be the uh, China Sea, I guess, uh, was uh, Yalabaru, which is a much smaller town. And about midway between that, uh, but those two, was Shuri, and Shuri Castle was um, centuries old and um, used by the uh, rulers as the sacred place and um, it was revered and uh, but defenses were very strong uh, at that area and we found later we didn't know it at the time they had extensive tunnels under under the Shuri area uh, they had a major 32nd Armor, he, Army headquarters of the Japanese was located in that. Um, their hospital was there, they had generators, and uh, they did have an exit on that that went down to the shoreline mm. to see. Wow. And um, uh, we were able to go through that uh, in, uh, well, twice, 1995 and 2001, on the two uh, times we were able to go back. Hmm. Well, wow. how about uh, the Okinawan civilians? Were, was there, where were they during this whole time? Did you ever come across them or confront them at all? Or in the northern part of the island, many of those were able to surrender because there was no intense fighting going on, and uh, they would show themselves, and they found that they were not going to be killed immediately. They did uh, surrender in pretty good numbers. Um, Unfortunately, the uh, well, the Okinawa people lost a third of their population during that battle, mm. and uh, the ones on the south were so brainwashed by the Japanese that they absolutely should not surrender to these barbarians, and they would retreat. And of course, what would happen is that uh, uh, as the army retreated, they would root them out of the caves, and then they would be killed by our shell fire things of that nature. Wow. So uh, it, uh, it's a bad thing. I um, occasionally did come on uh, a little pocket of them. I remember one time uh, there were probably 12 of them in a little shallow cave and uh, an elderly gentleman, quite old, had his arm shot off and I um, treated him and uh, uh, he was well, probably part of it was uh, malnutrition, but uh, he was so shivering and uh, 
loss of blood and all. Uh, I assume that uh, uh, the uh, uh, medical unit coming behind probably took care of him well. And I, I would hope that he survived. Yeah, yeah. And uh, probably got food to the rest of them. Some of them were young, quite young. Um, there's a picture that shows up now and then uh, on the History Channel that will show a, a small child sitting there yeah. and just shivering. Yeah. Well, we saw that. Oh, boy. Yeah. And I understand, too, not only were a lot of civilians killed in the war, but due to this brainwashing, a lot committed suicide. Uh, did you ever experience any of that? Or, uh, were you... They were usually deep in the cave. Oh. Yeah, what what they would do is retreat into the back of the cave and uh, uh, put grenades to themselves mm. and wow. yeah, yeah. commit suicide. Wow. So you said you went on to the front line in April, and I I see your your Purple Heart uh, 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 insignia on your on your jacket. I assume you were obviously injured, and maybe that uh, took you off the line. How long of a period of time were you on the front line? Well, all of May. And I was wounded on June 13th, and the island was secured on the 23rd, so I missed the last 10 days of it. But roughly two months on the on the front line then. Yeah, but yes, yeah, something like that. And um, we were start making an assault that morning, and um, I had just picked up a litter and uh, put it on my shoulder, and uh, we were getting some small arms fire, and uh, some mortars also. And uh, uh, it was probably shrapnel that got me, couldn't tell. It, uh, I was hit in the arm and uh, uh, the back. Mm. And uh, I was uh, walking wounded, so uh, I went back to the field hospital. I, imagine, I can't imagine very painful uh, injury or? Well, sure, yes, it was somewhat, but yeah. uh, uh, they, uh, they treated it and um, gave me a shot of morphine and I, had a good night's sleep. <laughs> well, that uh, that was the question I was kind of leading up to. You're, you're roughly on the front lines for two months. Were you guys ever relieved to go back and do a little, a little R&R and, and, and recuperate, or were, was there any gaps we went, where you could get back? Uh, and Yes, we went in reserve one time, and uh, reserve, of course, is oh, half a mile back or something like that. And uh, that time we did get a hot meal. That was the only hot meal. Otherwise... Our rations were uh, the canned sea rations uh, and uh, some biscuits in them. I, the biscuits were so hard, uh, it's a wonder we didn't break our teeth on those. And uh, we did get a few K rations at the last. And there was a period in May when uh, the roads were so impassable we couldn't get anything. They gave us some airdrops. Uh, they dropped food and ammo to us. Hmm. How about, uh, did you keep hydrated? Were you, were you getting enough water and, 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 and such? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. we always uh, uh, had five gallons of water in quantity, five gallons I brought up, and uh, I can't remember being short of water. Okay, so you're, uh, you, you take this shrapnel and you go back to the field hospital. Uh, where'd you go from there then? Were, they, were you operated on there or were you evacuated or how did? Uh... I spent one night there and they got the shrapnel out and I was uh, okay. Couldn't go up island uh, or down, yes, I would be up island going uh -huh. north uh, by uh, vehicle. So uh, we went down to the shoreline, got in a small landing craft and went up island. and. Uh, then I went to a hospital, a large tent hospital, that was uh, fairly close to the shore above the bay where the uh, Navy was getting all of the county causes. And uh, that night they had another attack and um, a piece of flak came through the roof of the tent and uh, the man about three feet from me was killed it went, oh, went right through him. So even back off the front lines in the hospital you still weren't in a safe area? No. Nothing was safe, but at least uh, uh, it was not as intense as yeah. by far. Were you in any in any position to, to view any of the kamikaze attacks? Did you see any of that uh, that at all? Or when we were on the front, we could hear a lot of the noises, but uh, couldn't really see any. And I don't recall anything. It was nighttime, so uh, I don't know. Uh, before we before we evacuate you off the island, uh, 
let's go back to the front line. You had mentioned before we started the interview about a friend from your hometown or someone from your hometown that uh, can you tell that story? Oh yes, uh, this is a young man that I had gone to school with, and he lived about oh, a few miles from uh, where my father uh, had his place, and um, I got a letter uh, giving uh, this. A lot of things would be censored, especially what we sent out. But uh, it named the division he was in and the regiment and all, and the company even. And um, well, that was the 7th Division. It was just right on our left. So I didn't immediately, but in a few days I could get a little break. And I did go back up to the line and move over and uh, went to his position and uh, found some of his friends. And he had been killed the day before. Oh boy! Wow. And uh, they said it was a sniper. I had to take. After I got home, I went to see his parents and told them what I uh, I could almost. It was a, right above yonder rule on a ridge there, and uh, I could just about pinpoint on the map where he was killed. Mm. And, oh yeah. boy! Wow. How uh, that leads to another question too. How was uh, communications back home as far as mail and such? I mean, here you're in these foxholes on the front line, were you getting mail back and forth? And, and how, how would that, uh, how'd that work? We received mail probably once a week. And um, I don't remember ever receiving any packages uh, that had extra food in them or anything like that. And uh, we wrote letters out, which uh, were v, uh, photographed and called V-mail. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, my, my parents and... Uh, Betty also got an occasional letter from me. Can't remember how we kept paper dry to write a letter and all, but right. uh, those are things that escape me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How was it uh, during holidays for you? As far as um, well, I guess I guess you were on the front line. There really wasn't any holidays in in that period of time, like Christmas. I guess you weren't there at Christmas oh. or Easter or anything like that. But uh, you're away from home for some holidays. Was that uh, hard to adjust to at all? or Again, it was kind of the uh, all part of what you were doing. We were always on the move and uh, holidays could go by. Just another day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't make any impact. Okay. Went to, um, going back when we were in reserve, we did have one uh, uh, religious service chaplain and uh, other than that that was uh, the only time just the one time when you were in, in the uh, the thick of things uh, did if it faith was an issue or something with you did faith play a part of you during that time was it something you relied on at all or was it uh, uh, I don't know how to phrase the question I guess did you mean as far as close calls and things like that? Well, I mean, just to help you get, get through. Did you rely on your faith at all to oh, get through oh, through yes. that period at all? Or? Well, uh, during the stressful time of whatever engagement you were in, you, you really didn't have time to think except what you were going to do. And mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. uh, you prayed between times, at least. That I'm sure they, everyone did. And all, but um, that's... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's continue your story. You're uh, now down at the uh, the beach. Uh, were you evacuated then off the island to a hospital ship, or how, where did you go from there? Yes, um, I might say prior to that, I thought I was kind of living a, a charmed life. I had it's awfully close calls. Oh yeah, talk about some of those. Yeah, well, I, um, I I become very much aware of the sounds of a rifle. Uh, bullet missing you, uh, oh, but gee. the ones that uh, come close to you, you don't hear them. It's just splat when it hits the, hits the dirt. Uh, mortars, we had, uh, the Japanese had what they called a knee mortar. It was something that they could set up very quickly. They braced it with their knee on a little base, and uh, you could hear them. They were just not very far over the ridge from us, so you could hear plum when it come out, and if you looked up, it was like a baseball, and you could avoid that. Wow, <laughs> jeez. So uh, that, that took place quite often. Um, other, other shelling and all, 
uh, our own artillery did an awfully good job, but we did get some short rounds now and then. And you learned to hear the sound of the, of the artillery shell. If it had a good sound, a good swishing sound, it was going to make it. If it was slowing down and kind of wobbly, you, you could also hear that. And uh, you moved down off the ridge awfully fast. Wow, wow. Uh, we had what might have been the only airstrike directly into the forward slope of where we were located. It was on Charlie Hill. And uh, I went up to put the orange markers out. And when I say I went up, I went up on my belly and... Now placed. the markers were to signify to our guys where, where you guys were at? Yeah, for, okay. the, for the fighters that were carrying the bombs to go okay. short of us. And uh, uh, they were pretty effective. They uh, uh, zoomed over us, not, not very, uh, very high because they had just cleared the ridge. <laughs> and uh, actually there was a movie made about that engagement. I uh, can't remember. It came out a few years after the war. And uh, yeah, that was Charlie Hill. I remember that. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, now, was the, were you getting support too from the Navy ships? Were they firing? Yes. I heard that's uh, quite a sound and to see uh, those big old shells flying. Uh, well, our own artillery, the 155s, were firing also. So uh, we didn't know actually by the sound of a shell which which mm. one it was but uh, we'd, we'd get on if they were get, the sound wasn't right uh, we got on the phone awfully fast and told them what was going on yeah right oh geez huh. so uh, now you're evacuated off the island uh, yes uh, I, I uh, was flown to Guam and in res retrospect I think if the uh, battle hadn't been nearly over. The, the morning I was wounded, uh, my CO came to me and he said, well, the battle was about over and uh, I'll see you before too long. And he was killed that afternoon. Oh boy. We lost two company commanders. We lost Colonel May, who was our regimental commander. Our general, General Easley, was killed by a sniper on the front line. And General Buckner, who was commanding the 10th Army, which was all the Army divisions and the Marine division, was also killed in the last day of the war. Hmm. So uh, I, I've always thought, after going back and seeing all the vantage points that the Japanese had to view us, we thought we were behind a ridge and we were safe, but we weren't, they could see us. And when clean uniforms would come to the front, that was the signal. There's something special going on here. So uh, uh, that's how close you were between life wow, and death. Geez. Uh, if I may, our company had the most killed of any company in our division. Uh, the 96th suffered the most casualties of all the divisions. And uh, we had 74 killed in action from our division and the average ratio when they took all of our division the ratio was for everyone killed there would be four wounded so if you do the arithmetic that's about total is up about 350 killed and wounded out of one company and how and big is a company about 180 so it was almost a two two time yes. turnover yes uh, the company should have had more than that, but they arrived under strength and never did get up to strength wow. on, on num in numbers. And you were saying, uh, uh, more so like in your case, had, had the war continued, you probably would have been patched up and sent right back up. Yes. So, so some of these guys were rotating That's right. twice yeah. or three times. Yeah. yeah, A lot of the fellas would in the early part. Uh, the fact that it was that close to being over, um, well... I had uh, jungle rot on my legs, as many of the fellows did, and uh, been trying to treat that with uh, some kind of a purple ointment. And uh, uh, but I was healthy otherwise. Uh, but uh, I think that's the only reason that I was evacuated at that time. 
Now uh, you went back and treated. Now speaking of uh, your shrapnel and your jumbo rot, were they able to, to get out all the shrapnel out of you? And, and is, yeah. uh, I guess my leads to the question, do either one of those injury, the, uh, the jungle rot or the shrapnel injuries, do they, either one of those, did they linger or any of them still bother you to this day? Well, the shrapnel was taken out right away that first night. Uh, as far as the jungle rot, uh, I was in the Midwest where the humidity is a little high in the summer. And uh, with the warm days, uh, my hands especially would dry and crack and bleed mm. uh, between, the, between the fingers. And uh, it took me, oh my, I think four or five years, uh, I was able to finally get a dermatologist who uh, treated ultraviolet or something like that and was able to stem it. Wow, wow. So you, you went to, uh, to Guam for treatment. How long then were you in the hospital down there? Probably a month. Um, I, I could have moved on, but um, they kept me there. And then they moved me down to Saipan. It was called a convalescent hospital. It was kind of a joint thing. It was a convalescent hospital and also a depot to return to your outfit. And uh, while I was at, at this convalescent hospital, uh, the J Japanese, well, the A-bomb was dropped mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, the war was over. So... Uh, Do you remember that day? Was there celebration going on there at the... At the post at all now we got the news and everyone had a big sense of relief yeah and, i'll bet and uh, went to bed <laughs> now between that time when you were in, in guam and in saipan were you able to get word back on how your company was doing or and, and how uh, any idea of how things were with them at well, all or? no uh see it only lasted 10 days mm -hmm. after that so it wasn't very long and then my company or the division rather went back to the philippines and I knew they were there, and I would have oh, okay. been sent from okay. Saipan to the Philippines. Okay. But, but then, then what happened, my father was injured, and I think uh, through the Red Cross, they were able to uh, allow me to come home. And so I was home by the end of the year. And you, do you remember that homecoming at all, finally getting, after all you'd been through, getting back home to peaceful uh, Well, I ended up in County, uh, Fort Logan in Denver, and... Uh, was discharged there and uh, I had a cousin there in town also saw him and then I uh, uh, went out to Stapleton Airport it was really out in the country <laughs> and uh, took a flight home to Des Moines and uh, had a relative come and uh, I think I arrived home in the middle of the night and uh, saw Betty first and went oh, wow. saw my parents and uh, that must have been a great feeling to mm -hmm. wow and then, uh, I guess, take your story from there. Now you're home and, and uh, yes. I, took, I guess, you took over the farm. and I got back in the swing of things. I took about a year and a half of night school from Iowa State uh, off campus. And then, uh, and helping Dad, uh, Betty and I uh, got married. And um, then uh, I was having a lot of trouble with the humidity and the... Um, dust pollen, hay fever, all of those things, weed allergies, and uh, took enough tests that they knew I wouldn't, uh, uh, I'd just have to put up with. So uh, we moved in, uh, my wife and I, we had three daughters, and we moved in 1950 to uh, Colorado. For the drier climate and yes. such? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. That helped a lot. Now, uh, how was it... Uh, in regards to the first question I asked you at the beginning of the interview, how was that transformation for you from going from military life and everything you'd just been through back to civilian life? Was that much of an adjustment for you? And Well, I never talked about it. I never talked about it until not too many years ago, especially after the family and I went uh, back uh, in 2001. But um, my parents never asked me anything about it. I, I can't criticize them. I right. just feel that they felt uncomfortable, that they might uh, bring memories to me that mm. I didn't mm -hmm. want to have uh, relatives the same way they didn't. Um, did did I, Betty or your mom ever talk about the worry they were going? They had to worry because, I mean, they, they had a rough idea where you were, but didn't know, you know, with 
particularly with a gap in communications and, and, the, and the censoring and stuff, had to wonder and worry. It had to be a, a very stressful time for them. Did they ever mention how, how they dealt with that? Or, uh, Not no? really. I'm yeah. sure they yeah. hoped and prayed for yeah. the best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's about all I can expect. Um, I, I remember uh, meeting a friend of mine he had gone to a different theater, I don't know where he was, and uh, he was the best man at our wedding. But uh, I don't know to this day where he was. We never talked about it. Isn't that something? Huh? Yeah. How, how was it, you know, now they've since, I don't think they had a diagnosis for it back then, but now they call it the post-traumatic uh, syndrome. Do you, do you feel like you went through any of that, uh, particularly since you didn't talk about it and, and things were kind of pent up? Uh, uh, nightmares or anything, any sort of residual effects from the war with you? Well, the, the post-traumatic is a, is a real thing. Um, I didn't suffer anything more than dreams that uh, brought back a lot of sad, sad memories. Uh, I was never in the cold sweat and all this mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that affected me has been this reflex thing. The first uh, summers that I was back and Fourth of July come, it was pretty tough. I, if a firecracker w went off behind me, I was down. Wow. In fact, not many years ago, a brother-in-law uh, of mine uh, was buried, and uh, they uh, had a squad behind. I didn't know they were behind us, and when they fired, I went about halfway down. I'll be done. Uh. Myself. Um, as far as, um, I lost my train of thought, we were talking about, uh, just the, the effects. Oh, the effects. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the big thing, um, World War II was so different in that the country was behind us. Patri patriotism was, uh, very strong. And um, some people have called it the popular war. Well, I don't know if I call it uh, that, but uh, it's so different because we knew who the enemy was. We knew our, our objective. And uh, we knew when we took, in the case of the Pacific, we took an island, that was it. I mean, yeah. it, it, uh, whereas these recent wars have been so terribly different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, these. Uh, 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 roadside bombs and all, mm -hmm. you know, that that's a lot of stress. Yeah, uh, right. Not, no, we had minefields and all, but we discover them before too long and bypass them. And we didn't really have any roads to follow anyway. So it was by chance if you ran onto a minefield most times. So I, I think it's a real thing for the young yeah, guys right. uh, or the young people now. Now you had mentioned that you had gone back to Okinawa in 95 and 2001. Uh, did that help at all with any sort of closure for you, or were you pretty at 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 peace with things prior before that? Or? Yeah, yeah, it, it did. I could see the beauty of the island. The Okinawa people are very industrious, and uh, what they have done, they restored the Shuri Castle. We were able to go through it. Um, it when you go through the castle. You really don't uh, talk among yourselves. It's it's a very sacred pe hmm. feeling that you have, and um, uh, the island of I mean the uh, town of uh, Naha is uh, very modern, and uh, we enjoyed the people. We enjoyed being back there, and the fact that I could walk to exact areas that I knew I had been before. Is that right? And wow. look at the peaceful. In fact, on Char uh, yeah, Charlie Hill, I have a picture of myself, myself standing on the next hill, which is Love, and that's where the fire was coming from. Looking back, and that area is a fairway of a golf course now. Oh, really? <laughs> you can see that uh, uh, things have, have changed. But even after all all those years, that, that big span of time and, and, and the change, uh, for example, the golf course, you could still find where you're, oh, yes. wow, yeah. wow, so that's something very deeply ingrained in your mind. Yeah, one uh, conical hill was uh, very 
prominent. We knew exactly where that was. And these other escarpments, uh, Tombstone Ridge, uh, uh, all of these were very, very easily identified. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's finish off the, the back part of this interview and, and talk a little bit about your post-war years. Uh, you moved out here to Colorado and and uh, talk a little bit about uh, your career and your family, and, and then we'll we'll slowly wind down the interview. Then all right, um, got, uh, came to Denver and uh, was still interested in agriculture, and uh, I went to work for a an irrigation company, and uh, they had a large area to cover. And uh, before long, I could see more opportunities of that. And I uh, then went with the manufacturer of, of equipment out of California. And I worked my way to be a district manager. During that time, I received a lot of technical training from them. Uh, did a lot of reading on the design of the work that I was doing. And uh, became a pretty, pretty competent person as far as uh, transfer of water, whatever it might be, friction loss and all of that, and enjoyed uh, very much 10 years of that, except for the traveling. I covered from Billings to Albuquerque, all of Colorado and in the edge of Kansas, Nebraska. Oh, geez. So it was uh, a lot of driving, a certain amount of flying. A lot of time and, away from uh, the family. And, and I did some consulting after that. In the same industry? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, for the same company, in fact. He uh, had a job that they want me to look at. And then I uh, took over the management of a uh, ranching operation in the south of Denver and uh, was there for 10 years until it, it sold to a developer. And uh, then I struck out on my own and uh, my family joined me. My oldest daughter I was just married and her husband had uh, animal science degree out of uh, Fort Collins, as well as um, biological background and all. So uh, we, we started the ranching business. And then more recently, well we started this about 10 years ago, uh, we did start a uh, water treatment. We discovered a way of treating wastewater to bring it up to the standards that were needed for discharge. And we're currently working on that with uh, municipalities. So I'm still uh, active. I go out uh, very often and uh, it's kind of like in the early days, Betty doesn't know uh, when I'll be here back again. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, for me, I've always been active and it's hard to shut, you can't turn the switch off yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to be doing something. So you had the three daughters, uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Uh, have uh, five grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. Our oldest granddaughter is uh, 12 or 13 and uh, is 5 foot 11 and uh, is a pitcher on a fast-pitch softball team. In fact, that team went to the national class. Is yes, that right? Yeah. yeah. And she's a good basketball player and, and a soccer player, or volleyball rather. And uh, the other youngsters are all coming along. They'll all be, uh, I have two uh, great granddaughters from Fort Collins, and we go to some of their events. And uh, next few weeks, we have some other uh, activities to go to. So uh, it's uh, harder to keep up with the great. Great ones, and, well, <laughs> and the grandchildren. Yeah, yeah, in a way. Yeah. Well, well, we'll start to wind down this interview. Is there anything that I didn't ask you uh, that you wanted to talk about, or any stories that have popped to your head as we've been in this uh, interview that you'd like to talk about, so that we hopefully make sure we we've covered by and large your your story here. Well, I have sadness yet. Uh, some of the young fellows that uh, were. I could have been the target as well, they were next to me, and one of them in particular told me to get down. I moved one way and he moved the other way and he was, he was killed. Uh, these are things that you don't try to dwell on, but they are in your mind, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and I, uh, I still get a big lump in my throat if I go to a memorial service. Uh, our division has had 
annual reunions. Oh, I forgot to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. and um, uh, with that, we always have a memorial service uh, on the last day, and uh, there aren't too many dry eyes yeah. there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we, uh, I have friends in the company, and uh, one of them handles pretty well. Uh, the other one um, lives in Texas, and uh, his family has wanted him to go back on uh, these trips to Okinawa. Our historian has arranged that most uh, all of these, and uh, he just he can't handle it yet. So uh, he must have pretty dark thoughts yet. Right, right, right. Well, my last question that I always like to ask in these interviews is, how do you think that period of time uh, affected your life, changed your life, played a role in your life, or do you see it just as a, simply as a chapter that you went through uh, in your life? Uh, how would you answer that? Well, it was a very short period of time, yeah. less than two years, but it, I, I feel that it had some deep effects as far as the dedication you put to any job you take on. Uh, I, I've never been a, a quitter, and I've always been felt that I could accomplish whatever I tried to do. Uh, I'm not bragging, I'm not that terribly successful, but nonetheless, uh, I think I've dedicated myself well because of the adversities that I uh, suffered during those times and, and survived them. Mm. And lastly, is there any sort of uh, closing comment or statement you'd like to make to friends and family that'll watch us now or someday in the future that you'd like to cap off this interview with? Well, yes, I would. Uh, uh, the family is very dear to me, and uh, that's not just the generations that I know now, which is my daughter and their children, and the great, there could be another generation beyond that that uh, may be looking at this. Uh, and uh, all I can say is that uh, I've, I've enjoyed life, I've, uh, I've had a good life, uh, my wife and I have uh, been able to travel and, and do things, and uh, although uh, I've stayed pretty busy all the time, and uh, we just I have great love for all, and uh, uh, we've attended family reunions on, on both my paternal and maternal side, and uh, uh, all of those people are a joy to know, and. Uh, they may be subjected to this sometime. <laughs> so thank you. Well, uh, Daryl, I want to thank you for sitting down to, to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. All right, thank you. I want to thank you again for the project you have here. Um, I found this picture and I had a little trouble identifying it and then I finally realized that that was me. <laughs> uh, shortly after the war I had this picture taken and or after I got home uh, actually and um, I hadn't had a uniform on since uh, the time I left the States you might say except fatigues and this is probably an issue given to me uh, we came into San Francisco Harbor and um, we were uh, put on Angel Island and um, we were quarantined there for, I don't know, three, four days, something like that. And I probably got this uh, uh, uniform uh, issued to me there. And uh, recently I read that uh, Angel Island was a Ellis Island of the West. Oh, is that right? Yes. Chinese and uh, Japanese uh, were uh, uh, brought into the United States in, at, at Ellis Island, uh, Angel Island, rather. Betty, can I ask you, uh, while we're looking at this picture, this was after the war, uh, what your thoughts were? Uh, did you see a change in Daryl from when he left and when he came back at, at all, uh, both physically, uh, emotionally? Any, was, there, was it the same Daryl that came back? Oh gosh, that's kind of hard to answer this many years later. Yeah. Um, 
uh, except for being more mature uh -huh. um, and having future thoughts of going to school yeah. uh, where before just going to work on the farm uh -huh. and uh, he had developed some th things that he wanted to do in his life um, I guess that's about what I could say okay. uh, you know we were so tickled that he was back sure absolutely we didn't absolutely. really examine uh, his feelings it's, right. we're together and this yeah. is what we're going to do okay okay very good well thank you uh, this, uh, we talked earlier about the boxcar mortar. This is the casing, shell casing of it, so you can see the size of it relative to the man standing in it. This would be the edge of the crater, so you could see the depth. It's well over his head. I'd estimate a 10 foot of depth. Uh -huh. And this thing, you could hear it coming, and uh, it was a huge hole. It really wasn't that effective, but except that. Uh, uh, it sure, certainly got your attention. Right. Oh boy, almost looks like a 55 gallon drum. <laughs> That's right. Uh, this is a typical tomb that the various families had as their individual tomb. And this was taken during the war. And it's in my uh, uh, history book of my division, the 96th division. And uh, this is this opening that we would uh, get into. And you can see the earth came down over the top of it. So you had pretty good protection. protection. Now, now would uh, uh, civilians take shelter in these things as, at all, or were they just too sacred for them to do something like that? They, we never found any civilians in okay. them. I think they would move back and get in because they had so many caves and tunnels. Oh, okay. That was, uh, there was no exit on this. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, they, neither the, uh, the civilians or the uh, military wanted to get captured. Okay. Now if I may, I'll put a photo in there. This was taken in 1991 where we were. This would be one of the original ones and you see how the vegetation now right, is yeah. growing around it. And uh, these are the old tombs and then you'll find in places like the Tombstone Ridge that there'll be a whole bit, a number of new tombs and uh, uh, we didn't talk about the cornerstone of peace. Well we can get to that. Okay. This is a picture taken again out of my, the history book of my division. And this is the remains of Shuri Castle after we had reached that point. And it was bombed extensively because here is the tunnel system that was underneath it. Hmm. And the 32nd Army had this, and this uh, area underneath here goes down. We've been through it and going back. A hospital under there, generators, and they actually had an exit from this high ground that um, came out to the shoreline of the sea. Wow. These pictures uh, are what have been restored and of today, uh, the entrance and the, the castle. And it's a very sacred place. Um, if you go through there as a group, um, you're, you're silent. You're just in, in awe of... Uh, how they respect this. Wow. We just finished talking about the uh, tunnel system and the large uh, installation underneath Shuri Castle. This is when we were back in 1991. This is uh, one of my son-in-law. And you can see the type of tunnel it was. Uh, out of the lava rock, they didn't have to shore it up and uh, gave them perfect concealment and protection. We found when we went back in 1995, we were told that the uh, Okinawa people had had a contest to um, name a memorial. And uh, they named it the Cornerstone of Peace. It's right here in English. And of course, that would be the Japanese word for it. And it's located south of Shuri in a very peaceful valley. and. Um, it's so well done. In the background, you can see the wall where all of the names are inscribed of the people killed, which includes the 14,500 or some of Americans and um, uh, the Japanese and also the Okinawa people. Hmm. 
Here's another shot, and this is of the wall, and uh, it's quite impressive. And uh, then here's a close-up of uh, one of them. I did tracings on that for uh, uh, the schoolmate of mine and got that to his family. The same guy that uh, you had uh, missed only a debut that had been yes, killed? Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. This stained glass is, uh, we were there for the dedication of it, and that was uh, 1995. And um, it is the chapel at Torrey Station, which is right near the landing beach. And it's the uh, symbol is the fallen soldier. Mm. And um, I have that unit on a, a small plaque here. These are the various divisions. This is the 10th Army, the 7th Division. I can't make out that. It might have been a Marine unit as well as this. This was the 77th, and this is the 96th, the, the Dead Eye, double, double diamond. Yes, uh, this uh, photo is of me standing on uh, Love Hill, pointing back to Charlie Hill, and that's the fairway of a golf course uh, where I was um, in a, uh, a very shallow depression of the ground and a machine gunner was intent on getting me and uh, the dirt from the bank was falling down on me and uh, oh, I guess you talk about uh, uh, not panic uh, having panic uh, that is a case of uh, I'm here today because I just uh, waited out and uh, didn't move Wow, I would I would think you know obviously it wasn't safe up on top of the ridge, but when it, when orders were to to move on, the things got pretty hairy dicey going down in these ridges or these valleys to get back up to the next ridge. Oh, it yes, had to be a very yeah, dangerous yeah. time. We were on the back side of this hill, made this assault, and uh, I was caught about here. And he was set up with his machine gun right down pretty much at the bottom of the valley because mm. there was a little concealment there, mm. and uh, then back of this um, Love Hill was Conical Hill, which we was our main objective. Uh, this is a picture taken in 2001 when our family went back, the eight of us, and we were in this uh, Buddha temple. And outside the temple is this large uh, bell, and um, oh, it must be uh, all of eight or ten feet in diameter, and um, there was a um, log that was suspended horizontally by two ropes, and uh, you could pull that back and let it go forward on its own momentum and hit the bell, and that gong had the prettiest sound. Is that right? And yeah. it traveled for miles, I believe. Uh -huh. This is a board I had made up a couple years ago, and um, probably, uh, I'll do my best to explain it, uh, probably some things could be added. Um, this is uh, my membership card to the 96th uh, Division Association, which has mentioned on the um, interview, uh, has an annual reunion. And this is dated um, 1966. I don't know if that was my first one or when they started issuing cards. And um, I've made many of the reunions, not all of them. This is our insignia patch. It's a double diamond. The 96 was known as the Dead Eye Division. Our um, commanding general stressed the importance that uh, you master a good marksmanship with a rifle. This was the 10th Army that made the invasion of Okinawa that included the Army and the Marine Division that took part. This is my, the seal of the uh, uh, 383rd Regiment. And, um, well, we'll go over to this side. This is the uh, Presidential Unit Citation that was given to the 96th Infantry. And this is the ribbon that goes with it, the blue with the gold. And then part of that, I'll jump down here, is the meritorious that goes with the narration of it. And um, this narration is in fine print, it's hard to read, but um, they credit the uh, 96th 
with 37,500 uh, Japanese enemy in, in the battle. Wow. So um, those were good things that gave recognition to what uh, the uh, military did do. Uh, this is the combat infantry badge. These are my dog tags. This is the expert um, um, rifle, marksmanship, and uh, the ribbons. Um, it's not um, on my um, military record that I uh, did the job as a medic, uh, and I don't uh, have the medic seal there, but um, I uh, now have the uh, authorization. I plan to be buried at Fort Logan, uh, National Cemetery, and uh, I have the authorization by letter from the uh, uh, head of that department that I can put on that combat medic. Is that right? Uh -huh. So uh, <laughs> that's what uh, my family will see. Uh, this is a bronze star, and um, um, the day I was wounded, my uh, CO who had recommended me for a medal uh, was killed and everything must have stopped there. Um, I received a letter later on from um, whoever was uh, taking over the division that um, Captain Nabel, who was the head of the field hospital, and I got to know fairly well, had um, told him that I was deserving of a medal and he wrote that in a letter. Well, as you get a letter, you know, you put it in the cubby hole, and I didn't think much about it. And uh, I had never received a medal at, at that time. So finally, about, well, it must be six or seven years ago, I thought, well, I'm going to forward that letter along with an explanation to the War Department, uh, explaining what was the intent of that letter. And uh, with that, of course, I got the the normal governmental bureaucracy that I had to get witnesses and all that. Well, there weren't any witnesses because uh, it was an assault that was um, we were suffered casualties mm. on and losses. But eventually, I got the Bronze Star, and um, that's this plus the ribbon here, mm -hmm. and uh, and this is a Purple Heart as a result of uh, of uh, the injury. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm proud that I was able to give my support to a country in a desperate time of need. Very good.